I've never worked with a, you know, a camera, a lens based photography, I guess. Wait, so how are you making these images? I use a flatbed scanner. And you just flatbed scan the floor? Yes. Oh, okay. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. I did yeah. not. Uh, I, I read the thing. I, I just, I, can't, I guess I was, I read it the way you do at openings. Welcome to What's My Thesis. I'm your host, Javier Proenza. Every week, my guests and I share the answers we found and the questions we have. Join us as we explore and expand our worldview and ask, what's my thesis? And today, my guest, well, first of all, we're here at the amazing Fulcrum Press here in Chinatown, which is amazing. Thank you to Josh Shadle for letting us record here. And my guest today is Megan Muller, who I know through Monta Vista Projects. And oh, by the way, we're at her, her, uh, Megan's show here at uh, Fulcrum, which yes. is really amazing. Yes. Thanks for doing it here. This is so exciting. Oh, I'm super excited that we could do it here. Um, okay. Are you California-based? No. Originally, no. Okay. I'm from Manassas, Virginia, which is a suburb, suburb of Washington, D.C. I've driven on the I-5. My sister and I have had a lot of fun at that name. Oh, I'm just, just I'm, reading it. I'm Manassas? Sure. Yes. <laughs> well, that's uh, when we were growing up, I couldn't remember how to spell it. And so my mom broke it down and she was like, say, you know, say to yourself, man, ass, ass. And so <laughs> that, was, that was the trick. I like it. Yeah, d- Dumb Fries was another one that was yes, very popular. Yes, yes. Wait, so why why have you been over there? Uh, I used to live in Maryland. My dad uh, is a uh, diplomat for the UN, so we, wow. he lived in D.C. for a while. Yes. And I would visit from Florida. Wow. Wait, so where are you originally from? Uh, I grew up, I was born in D.C. I grew up in Costa Rica, Italy, and Miami. Wow. And then went to college from to Maryland for a little bit. Okay. Community college there. Awesome. What about you? Virginia. Bo- yeah, born and raised Manassas, Virginia, until I went to college. Is it like really small towny? No, it's a it's suburby. Suburby. Yeah, sprawly. You know, adjacent to Los Angeles. Lots of strip malls. Okay. Yeah. When did you get into art? Yeah, so I came to art a little bit later in life, uh, probably around the age of twenty. 20- 22, I would say. I originally went to school for political science. um, And that was just because I didn't know what else to do. I I was like good at a mock trial uh, in like a, um, you know, a business of law class in high school. So I was like, well, it's the only thing I've really been good at. (laughs) So maybe I'll (laughs) choose that. Um, Yeah. So I was working for a contractor for Homeland Security. That was my first job out of college. And it was heartbreaking, as I'm sure you can imagine. And uh, you know, just 21 years old, like, uh, you know, working in a basement downtown DC and, and essentially just was like, I can't see myself doing this, yeah. you know, for 30, 40 years and then retiring. So it, you know, started a, a journey, you know, trying to steer my ship more into like waters of creative pursuits and just had to figure out like, what do I actually like doing? Uh, so I applied to, so anyways, my, my thought process was, I had enjoyed Project Runway as the te- the television show, mm-hmm. and I was like, maybe I want to do fashion. Okay. So I applied to schools, and I only got into one that was like a fine arts program, and so that's kind of that's where it all started. F- fate. Yeah. Pigeonholed you. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> well, that's interesting because I don't know. I I would have imagined that there may have been other stops. Like, you know, because you didn't necessarily have to work in political science at, for a defense contractor, but it must have burnt you out and, like, made you feel so jaded is what it sounds like. Immediately. Yeah. 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 DC is pretty rough like that. Yeah. Well, right. Yeah, you yeah. would know. Yeah. Uh, my dad hated, like, because he, he worked for um, FAO, mm-hmm. which is the Food and Agriculture. It's like who, but for... Um, economy and like it's stimulation programs and stuff like that so he was but um when he was in dc it was like super different super competitive like super cutthroat he was working for the inter-american development bank as a liaison and he was not a fan like as soon as he got back to italy he was so relieved so the jobs in dc i can totally see how there's not a pivot out uh but interest so like when that's still such a hard thing though to like just suddenly declare art as like, I'm an artist. I've even, I've struggled with that. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that process. Yeah, sure. Like from when you, when you got like maybe accepted into the program, you started to shift to think from like fashion. Maybe I'm like, because I mean, there's plenty of room for political science and art, right? Well, yeah, sure, sure. I didn't have much 
exposure to art, I would say, growing up. And it's so funny because DC was so close to us and I had been to a museum, but for some reason it, it just never, I never connected the dots that I was a creative person or that you could be a creative person and have a, a life. And so, yeah, it, it, I went to, so I got into VCU in Richmond, Virginia, their art school. And they make, uh, what you, is that short for? Sorry. Uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Okay. They make you do a one-year foundations program, and then you apply into programs. So I had already received a bachelor, bachelor's degree, and so I could go, you know, I knew I could go back to art school and kind of crank it out in two years. Uh, that being said, I did this, this kind of, you know, foundation year and got to, like, see sculpture, really, for the first time, painting for the first time, graphic design really for the first time. And it just blew my world open. And so from there, I, I was like, well, maybe it's not necessarily fashion and garments. I consider those things sculptural. They, you know, they sit on bodies, they have texture, they have, you know, color involved. Like maybe it's, maybe it's crafts. So, so craft was an option of mm -hmm. majors there and you could work, you know, with textiles, fibers, but it was more like to a sculptural end. Um, and then I also got to take sculpture classes at the, at the time. So that is what I ended up graduating with the degree in. And yeah, it was just, ex you know, exciting. It was just the first time I had really had access to art history, contemporary art. And it, it yeah, it was just uh, eye-opening. I love the idea, art history being a distinction Right, like as opposed to just being part of history, mm -hmm. which is like such an American thing because over here it's not like you're walking through propagandistic architecture. I mean, you are, but it's not the same. Like, so like when I grew up, I was like, it was just history. Yeah, you know, yeah, because <laughs> like art was just the artifacts of the history, mm -hmm. which is which is a really crazy thing to think about. But like that speaks to sort of how it's like a separate thing, even for your experience, where you just kind of discover it right. as a separate thing instead of something that's like taught in schools or, you know. Do you? So what I found that that degree gave me was the introduction to visual literacy. Yes, and so hundred percent. I remember in an art history class going up to the teacher afterwards and be, and being like, I don't get it. Like what? You know, we we're like interpreting paintings and things like that, and I was like, I don't get it. And so then they started to talk about like the proximity of figures and you know like the the edges sharper versus softer in the color palette and, and just kind of starting to understand that these things inform us when we look at them. And that that was you know eye opening to me. I'm wondering, did you do you feel like you had a like, so I guess maybe in Italy then, do you feel like you I had a visual literacy just kind of involved in all of your education? Yeah, because, I mean, we, I went to a private British school and it was like an international school. So there were a lot of kids that were parents were diplomats and stuff like that. So it was not, I don't know, but I imagine like the Italian kids, I have no concept of like what liceo was or any of that, like, like actual Italian public school system is. Okay. They were always like kind of a separate thing. We had our own community of other schools like AOSR, American Overseas uh, School in Rome, uh, and all of those. But I think, like for example, when I was a little kid, I was like obsessed. I knew all the names of all the 13 old bridges in, in Rome. And so there's like a rich cultural history in that city that I don't think it's not even necessarily just Europe. Like it's called the Eternal City because there's like four cities stacked on top of each other, mm. right? So, so, but like the idea of uh, buildings as propaganda it, it, and, and spaces that are like, that use the golden ratio to sort of get you a sense of that. So I was, to me, I always kind of looked at art history. Well, once I got over here, I started started to see it as like maybe an, an emotional description of what people are going through, even as fraught and problematic as it is, because it's mostly male and white. But you know, you you like I don't know. Is uh, who's the dude that did the? Um, I'm fucking blanking on names. Gogan is, is he's the one that did the paintings of the brown ladies, right? No. I'm the worst person to okay. ask. Yeah. This is an art podcast. This is embarrassing. Do you know who I'm talking about, Christine? Are you talking about the Tahitian? Yes. Yes. It's Gogan. Okay. So like. He married a thirteen-year-old. I know. Like exactly. Okay. <laughs> so in that, there's like at least some expression of colonialism, but not maybe from the right perspective. 
But anyway, the point being that, like, yeah, I, I find art as a, as a concept here in the U.S. What, I think that, like, what a lot, a lot of stuff that you and Josh are addressing, especially in this show, which I don't want to get into, like, describing the visual elements, but the concept of photography as an object, rather, you know, uh, which is kind of... Di- dying out because of how we consume images mostly, right? Like, so um, you guys, I, I, he, on his episode, he talked a lot about how, and at uh, Josh Shadle, about how, uh, you know, photography is now vinyl on the floor that you can walk on and things like that. And so presently, how do you, like, what is you, your practice? How do you define, are you a sculptural photographer? Because he re- referenced that. Is that, is that a, a term that you, you would use to describe it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, definitely. So coming from a sculptural background, I feel like I still treat everything like it is sculpture, but, you know, it just ends up being flat or flattened um, throughout the processes that I've come up with. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's, I so appreciate Josh's, um, you know, including me in this space and in the photography conversation because I have, um, I I don't know it. I, you know, he's, he's really educated me a lot on certain aspects of it. And I do consider myself an image maker, but you know, in an experimental fashion using the flatbed scanner, like I've, I've never worked with a, you know, a camera, a lens based photography, I guess. Wait, so how are you making these images? I use a flatbed scanner. And you just flatbed scan the floor? Yes. Oh, okay. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. I did yeah. not... Uh, I, I read the thing. I, I just... I, can't, I guess I was... I read it the way you do at openings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it, And that's a funny story in that, uh, you know, we moved to Los Angeles. I came to California for grad school in Santa Barbara, uh, moved to Los Angeles after graduation, and we did live in a, like a live-work space, but the idea of woodworking or, you know, like the, like the noise of a chop saw or something like that, or just kind of living with that dust wasn't necessarily an option. And so I, I struggled a little bit to figure out like, what am I going to, what are my art making materials now that I'm in this different situation? You know, I'm out of school. I don't have a, you know, like the resources that you do at an institution. And I work, you know, had like a day job and I would like probably like a year in, I started to like sneak thing like collages onto the photocopier and you know like when when you like the light is moving across the Mm -hmm. the page you can kind of like move things around and creates glitches and things like that so that that I guess yeah started this process for me and so uh yeah so I bought a scanner and then had been dragging things home to scan them in our studio and then eventually just started to take the scanner outside with me like on walks and stuff like that so it's a flatbed scanner. How big is it? Um, the bed is eight and a half by eleven. Eight and a half by eleven. And you you scan? Does it have its own memory, or you scan to a computer or a laptop? Yeah, I scan to a laptop. Oh my god! I'm just, like I'm just burdened by all this equipment that we just broke out to do this. <laughs> like, well, it's yeah, it's pretty low tech. You know, uh-huh. it's very like we actually were just scanning before we got here. Um, uh, the south, so another uh, terrazzo floor at the Southwest Law School in Koreatown. And uh, yeah, so it's just my laptop. It's just the scanner and attached with like a USB cord. Okay, so then um, tell me about the locations. I mean, if if because it, it, it sounds like we can get into a conceptual space that's not necessarily visual and hard to listen to. Yeah, yeah. Walking in Los Angeles is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, and then just a heads up, I think this is our topic. Yeah, per, it absolutely <laughs> could, could be. Um, one of yeah, so it's it's just truly one of my favorite things to do, and so I took a terrazzo tour organized by Renee Reisman like five or six years ago, where we walked down Broadway and an artist whose first name is Erin, last name I forget, uh, but very I can look it up and tell you later. Mm-hmm. Um, but she led us on this walking tour, pointing out these terrazzo surfaces, and essentially they are. Uh, on Broadway in downtown Los Angeles, markers of theaters, you know, so that used to be like the theater district. And so not all of them are still being used as theaters. So they're, they're kind of these like indications that the, the buildings were, had different purposes, you know, used for something different at a different time. And just that history I, I find very uh, exciting. And so that's kind of led me to do my own walks and start to research buildings um, on my own. And yeah, it's, I would say too, you know, like that isn't something I will put on my list of things to do is just like just walk 
in one direction, you know, go, go somewhere, walk in one direction, see what happens. So you go in your car to a spot and then you get out and you walk. Yes. What's, uh, what's your favorite? So it's almost like you're, you're urban camping or urban hiking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that, so I have like, I think the logic of it makes a ton of sense to me just because of how I grew up and who I grew up with. And so Mm -hmm. like I'm from Virginia, but my mom is from West Virginia. So we would always like go there to a cabin on the weekend, spend a lot of time outside in the woods And I have uncles and a grandfather who were hunters, you know, so the idea of like getting dressed up in like either high visibility orange or some sort of like camouflage, you know, uh, jacket and then going and sitting outside and just staring at your environment looking for something like that's what I feel like I'm doing. So is here, are you, is Manassas Appalachia or not? Yeah, we're like the edge. Okay. I would say we're the edge of a lot of things. Okay. Yeah. Just, just wanted to be precise in how I was visualizing. Sure. (laughs) Sure. It was rural at a certain point. Uh Um, and it is rural adjacent, I would say. So it's like, uh, I'm getting, um, I don't even remember the guy's name. The guy that did the track houses and Robert Adams. Yes. I figured it out. Okay. okay. Robert Adams. Uh, I'm picturing a lot of like those little, um, cookie cutter houses, which like all the same houses are all the like neighborhoods have like maybe three different models that people originally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For sure. I find that California was like that at one point, but maybe it's just been long enough since when those places that the houses have been rebuilt and changed. Mm. But that's my suspicion. Mm -hmm. I don't, I I can't imagine that they just were like, we're going to build a whole bunch of independently and different homes in, uh, in these suburban areas. Right. Like that doesn't seem like it seems to go against the ethos. Mm -hmm. Right. All right, so walking in L.A. So it, I want to go back because you said uh, terrazzos, tarot, uh, right? Yes. So those are basically... They are... Uh, so everything here is an exterior... or so The things I'm looking at are exterior uh, sidewalks. So it's, um, it's a decorative treatment to the sidewalk. So typically um, you have some sort of like divider and then you're putting like a... F- uh, particulate into it and then grinding it down to a flat surface. So like these I think are marble with, you know, like different types of stones kind of ground, you know, like mixed up in the, mm. in the mix. And let's see, I'm going to do this too. Sam, am I representing Terrazzo correctly? Yeah, for the most part. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Decorative, I'm just... Decorative application of crushed excess stone. So Typically a brass right. separating. So can you repeat what he said so that we have On mic? Yeah, yeah. D- what did you say? <laughs> he said I was right. Yeah. 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 He, yeah. He's, it's basically it. like large, uh, it's like, it sounds a little bit mosaic-y, but not yeah. quite. Yeah, exactly. Like What's that? It's like a micro mosaic process. Yeah, micro mosaic process with a lot of, um, with, with brass pieces holding everything in place. It's, uh, it, I mean, it definitely f- looks like it's not like an obscure thing. You've seen sidewalks like this. Definitely. Yeah. Well, and the interesting thing about them, at least in Los Angeles, is they, the sidewalk is typically like the city's responsibility to maintain, but because these are, you know, have a, like a, an aesthetic to them, they're considered artwork. So that means it's the building's responsibility to maintain them. So you'll find a lot of them in disrepair yeah. uh, because there is some sort of disagreement on whose responsibility it is to, to and there's uh, for the upkeep. Wear and cigarette butts and stuff in your, in your scans. Yeah. I did. So you're like, <laughs> do you have to wipe off the scanner often? No, I really don't. Um, I do, like, I kind of like the fact that the debris, you know, stays with it and something I mean, that I've between, scanned in before. Between scans, oh like, no, no, no so yeah. it's, it doesn't get. It does it, it? I guess the glass doesn't pick up a lot of dirt. Ah, uh, it well, it does, but it's like a part of it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this this large piece behind me has been in my studio, you know, for a couple months, and uh, it was so big it curved out onto the floor. And a lot of times, I would be like, "Is that like a hairball that I scanned, or is that a hairball <laughs> from my dog?" <laughs> you know, like like it's just it's tough to tell. Cool. Well, that's interesting. I mean, there's always different ways of doing photographic practice, but I definitely like that it is. I, 
I'm interested in it because you are headed, approaching photography in the opposite direction that I did, you know, where I was like, I studied photography. One of the most important things that I studied was history of photography, going back to an earlier uh, conversation, which is just the idea of like how images inform our perception and are uh, quite often not true. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, um, or, de- or, at, or at the very least, they're deceptive. And I just became, I would get frustrated trying to become, uh, trying to do photography like in the traditional style, right? Yes. Like, like trying to be a Dorothea Lange or a, even like a, what's it called, William Eggleston. Like that straight photography um, model was hard for me. So I definitely started to enjoy the camera for its limitations and start thinking of objects. So I, I, I really appreciate how you came to this from that perspective, which is like, um, you're kind of using a tool in a way that is not necessarily used, but it's it, it works. What resolution? I like. Uh, it, it, what, what are we t- dealing with here? Three hundred DPI. Three hundred DPI. So that's I haven't played with photo- digital photography in so long. So, but at least it's it's printable resolution, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. And then all right. So then you're going on these walks, how, um, you, and then you start thinking about what. In particular, yeah, um, thinking about surfaces and thinking about. Ex- um, I should say too. I I feel very akin to like archivist practices. So sometimes I think about this not even really as art. It's just kind of share like some sort of aesthetic outcome of my you know visual research. And uh, I very much care about space. I think public space is also like very important. And, you know, sometimes these feel like condition reports to me where, like, this is kind of, you know, a moment in time. This is what this sidewalk looked like this day. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's the Dunkin' Donuts wrapper and the cigarette butt and the, you know, this many gum stains. And to come back, you know, a couple weeks later, they're they're different, you know, no matter, kind of no matter what. It's, which is fascinating to, to know. Yeah, I guess to know, like, the cracks of something or like I did one over the summer where, you know, it felt accurate. I guess that's another thing too about this practice where I think I personally give images a lot of authority. And so what I like most about making these things is like the closer you get, the more there they get wonky, you know, the more, the closer you get, it's like, Oh, this line actually isn't straight. Or you can tell I had to like patch this area for some reason and, you know, I think that's just kind of a metaphor for, for image making. And you're not necessarily going methodically, right? You're like, you're, uh, you're not doing it in a grid format. There's like overlapping of the scans, it looks yes. like. Yes, yes, yeah. So you're taking one scan and maybe another scan will overlap with that. And that's where the pe- pieces of paper are yes. touching. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, what I th- think is interesting also is that it is, the, the record there are places where you can see it's been repaired. Yes. Oh, and, yes. And then there's there's places where places where you can see there's just like more wear from people stepping on it. Right. You know. So it's a it, it, it's a really interesting. I had a it also reminds me I had a uh, painting teacher in uh, when I was in Florence that was like obsessed with painting things with a perspective of like three inches. So he mm. would paint all the um, like overhead shots of the relief floors at like the cathedrals and whatnot and then I uh, put like a croissant on a plate and just work really hard to get like the differences between the, the depth and master that and while that sounds tedious this <laughs> it, it was kind of glorious in this like really like uh um I don't know. Ro- like it was a, a typical romantic. Like I was twenty two, so I was like, "Oh yeah, you're cool." Yeah. I think it's like, oh, okay, that sounds torturous. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but the idea of floors also reminds me a lot of that. Where I, you know, I don't think that there are that many places that have floors of this scale. Like that makes me. These definitely make me think of what they are. But, you know, the passing of time and the ill, Ill repair of them. It, you know, especially because no one wants to be responsible for them. <laughs> it's kind of very American in its approach to uh, how we like maintain history, and, yes. I, and I appreciate that uh, as a uh, as a sense of responsibility on your end. Well, it's yeah. I think taking care of things becomes more and more important to me as I get older, and it's it's funny that that might be the thread of like all of my creative experiences. So. 
backing up when I graduated from this like other undergraduate arts degree, I got an internship at the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, D.C. Mm. And so I worked there for two years, which is where I met Sam. Uh, we had to rebuild a Henry Moore pedestal together. Wow. Yeah, which is, uh, you know, interesting and romantic on its own. But <laughs> uh, my job was to clean the outdoor sculpture, you know, so I got to to like intimately know these objects. And, and like I knew that this one spider, no matter what, was going to like set up its web you know, from the wall to the head of this figurative sculpture, you know, and it, it would like... It was the same spider? You, didn't, you never killed it? Oh, I never killed it, no. Oh, and okay. I'm, you know, I don't know. I'm assuming it's the same spider, but, or it's good real estate for I was a spider. just attributing it to your, like I was uh, imagining like that mouse trap movie from the 90s, where it's like the guy fighting the mouse and the mouse always wins. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, like yeah. a Wile E. Coyote type setup. Abs- where the, absolutely. Where the spider's outsmarting you every time. Yes, yes. No, Very you much probably, that. <laughs> it probably was just the real estate. But, uh, so, so then what, um, tell me about those spaces. Like, how do you, how do you think LA compares to that? Because I think that if we're looking at the pieces of floor that we have here and the way that DC kind of treats its monuments and all of that, I mean, I think that that's a pretty interesting connection there, right? Like, why do you think LA is so like, fuck it? (laughs) Well, I mean, that was a, you know, a museum funded by the, the, like whole, the government. Like, LACMA takes care of their outdoor sculptures. You're it, right. You're right. But I would say, no, I, I'm, but I mean, in, in general, the whole city itself, just like everything is a monument, I guess. So it all gets taken care of. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It, D.C. is a weird space. So we, you know, I did live there, um, you know, after school. And, and I think in a lot of ways it taught me how to be an artist, uh, you know, cause there really isn't any, like there's the, you know, kind of like the, the big time blue chip artists showing in, in museums. And then there's no middle, middle tier gallery. And then the rest of it was just D, like the DIY scene. And, um, you know, I think like punk rock music, you know, has such a, like a rich history there that I think like DIY culture, um, just kind of permeates, you know, your, your life. And if you, like when we lived there, I think only 600,000 people lived in the city, but I, Mm -hmm. it like flexed up to 3 million a day of, you know, commuters coming in from Maryland and Virginia. Which is what I was. Yeah. I was a Marylander. Okay. So you went from restoring, let's because I want to transition. I did want to ask you about um, the organization that you're with now. That, okay. Uh, what, what's that called? The uh, So it's the ECF Art Centers. ECF Art Centers. And I have I was became aware of them through uh, OPAF. So what's ECF? Right. So we, uh, the ECF Art Centers is a uh, studio space for adult artists with developmental disabilities. And there are five locations in Los Angeles County. So uh, Inglewood, uh, Jefferson Park, downtown Los Angeles, Whittier, and San Pedro. So each, uh, each location, they're, they're technically a day program. So it's, it's adults who are eligible for services and they've expressed an interest in art. So they, like working with the regional center, they get assigned to one of our art centers. And then I would say our culture is more of a progressive studio. So the idea is that it's not able-bodied instructors teaching disabled artists how to make art. It's thinking about what the the artist is naturally inclined to do and just amplifying that. Okay. And right now at Monta Vista, we're showing a Larry, uh, Larry Dunbar. Dunbar's work. Yeah. So Larry Dunbar is an artist uh, from our South LA studio, which is the one in Jefferson Park. Okay. And he does what? Ceramics? And he's a ceramic. Yeah. Uh, well, he's actually uh, extremely talented in fashion design, okay. drawing, painting, and ceramics. And so what? what is your... I mean, obviously, I see the trajectory. You probably seem a lot happier now than when you were working for... Lo- I'm going to say Lockheed Martin, even though... <laughs> it's funny that you picked that one. My dad worked for Lockheed Martin. I did not. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a great job. I have to say I'm not a... like. Uh, it, we have a, like a larger parent organization called the Exceptional Children's Foundation. So it's it offers lifespan services for people you know mm-hmm. with disabilities throughout their entire life. And so we have like a marketing department. So I I do not speak for ECF. I'm here as a no no no. You know, I was not too. implying. Yeah, yeah no no no. no I, just, I just I'm just more curious about the organization than yeah. anything else because it's a, it's pretty it's a pretty cool. Um, I mean I've seen some of the work that comes out of there and it's. I mean, Larry's show is amazing. Yes. We're, we're, Christine and I are very excited about it, right? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I loved galleries. 
So, all right. So then how long have you been with them and, and what is your role? Yes. I've been there for three years and I am technically the gallery and events supervisor. Okay. But we uh, closed our gallery in March 2020. We've not reopened it and we don't really have plans to uh, for the foreseeable future. And so I've switched gears to try to tackle our inventory archive. So, you know, a fair amount of our artists have been with us since the Art Center started in 1968. So we essentially have their life's work um, stored. And yeah, just making sure things are labeled and easy to find. We just started working with a database. Uh, We're working, thinking about our website as a, you know, kind of an introductory archive for our artists to have presence and, you know, making sure that they're included and what that looks like is is a large part of my job. And I didn't check to see, is there a price list? Uh, are, like, is the objective to sell work uh, and, and whatnot? Definitely. Definitely. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. I need, a, uh, <laughs> I need help in that. Well, yeah. I mean, I think... That's amazing. It's, that's a great... That's, it's, a, it's an amazing project because, like, I mean, I wouldn't even know how to approach it if I didn't have help from, like, my community yes. directly, you know? Yeah. And that took a long time to even figure out. So it, it's a really amazing program it sounds like definitely when I think the conversation around value is important so you know like we try to have conversations about like like are you interested in selling your work you you know and the answer is yes or no you know so it's like going with people who say yes and you know the people say no that's that's great because the work still has um you know tons of value um you know, because it's coming from these extremely talented artists, because it represents artists from Southern California, because it represents artists with a developmental disability. So we also try to operate from a like person-centered thinking logic, which means it's like uh, everything starts with a person, and and you're asking them for their input, and then and then you go from there. Interesting. All right, so let's go back to walking. Okay, because I definitely did want to ask about that, but. Uh, I don't want to make you a representative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but okay, so um, maybe we can talk a little bit about your curatorial practice too. Sure. Okay. Sure. So uh, let's get a little bit more about that. So you are, um, you've you've done you've curated Larry's show. Yes. And then you also did uh, Infrastructure Lovers before that. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that show, how you go about organizing something like that? Definitely. More more than anything so that I can take notes. Yeah, (laughs) sure. Uh, That's funny. Maybe do it instructional video style. Okay, okay. (laughs) Um, I would say it goes back to the DC DIY ethos that was kind of ingrained in me from being like a young person trying to be an artist there. And so, um, you know, and then just like reading those like manifestos from um, like artist run spaces in Chicago that are like, uh, what you know? What resources do you have to share? It's your responsibility to to share them, and like if you don't have an opportunity, you make one. So um, that's kind of always been the motivating factor behind that. But the, yeah, it like goes back to like my brother and I would organize art shows in our backyard, like at my dad's house when we were in college. Uh, he so when I went back to school at VCU, he was also at VCU. So we would you know collaborate on things like that. He was studying art too. Uh, yeah, graphic design. Okay. Yeah, shout out Joe. Uh, <laughs> shout out. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so Sam and I ran an artist run space in DC. Uh, you called, ran one. Yeah. Called what was it called? Sorry. Delicious spectacle. Um, so that was in you know basically we he went to grad school at, at American University in okay. DC. And so they had a professor who moved to Berlin and asked a couple grad students to like take over her lease in her house while she was away. So we had this row home, uh, essentially like Columbia Heights Petworth, and none of us had any furniture. Like everybody lived in a studio apartment prior to moving in. So um, you know we really didn't have furniture for the first floor. So we decided to use it as an exhibition space, and we would invite people in to do projects. And uh, yeah, so that that was one when we moved to LA. We lived a, in like a live workspace downtown, so we would organize art shows on the roof of our space. That project was called Gate. Gate. Okay. G A I T. Um, our our computer named it. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, a screensaver on our desktop that seemed to 
ref, like it would have like a word of the day with like a word in its definition and it seemed to reflect the conversations that we were having, you know, so we're <laughs> like, this is terrifying, but it actually, it's hard to name stuff. So we were just like, well, this is interesting to us. This is interesting to us. And let's see, let's see what happens. And it came up with gate, which was uh, defined as a distinctive way of moving through the world. Oh, okay. So, all right. Yeah. That's what I thought you said. Yeah. I, I have a problem visualizing spelled out things. Like I'm the worst audio speller. So w- when you said that, I was like, wait, is she saying it because it's gate or it's because it's gate? Yes. Well, <laughs> it, just to make sure it isn't G-A-T-E, it's gate G-A-T-E, of like, yeah. you know, gatekeepers and like, yeah, yeah, we weren't engaging that context at all. No, for sure. For sure. So. Oh yeah. So yes. Yeah, so, um, always been doing this. It's important to me. I think sometimes in, in exhibitions, formats, you know, it's, I consider it research. And so typically it's, uh, initiated by some sort of conversation that, that seems interesting or, you know, I'll do a couple studio visits just for fun and then be like, Oh yeah, it seems like this person and this person and this person are, you know, having this like similar investigation, like it'd be great to get them in the same room and, you know, kind of see what happens. Um, sometimes I'm in these shows too, which, um, still feels slightly taboo to me, but I, um, but the I do it anyways. Great, yeah, thanks. <laughs> so th- those were all levels. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so, and it is an interesting thing to kind of be. I mean, I feel like being an artist is is its own like inescapable uh, thing that it can be either a burden or an a, an enjoyable thing. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I'm mm-hmm. not like uh, categorizing it either way. But I feel like curating is like it's in more in depth like other step and need, you know, it, cause it's like you said, it's its own investigation, yes. which is like, it's interesting. I find myself right now in a cycle where I've been doing the show so long that I'm, that even though I joined Mona Vista, I'm like, I don't want to curate anything right now, yeah. you know? Uh, but, but I do, I do feel like that need is not going to go away. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, I don't, I don't know what, like I, maybe there is more of a need for community involved in that. Whereas, uh, and then I think there's like a little bit of also taking authority Mm -hmm. where you're like, like you're saying like, I'm not waiting for anybody to tell me I'm, I'm a tastemaker, you know, I'm a decision maker. I think I have a way of, uh, I, you know, coming up with this discourse, you know, it's, I mean, that's technically why the show's called what's, what's my thesis. There's definitely a, a, a moment of inquiry that goes into sort of, trying to analyze how these things go together yeah, and, and all of that. Right. So questions are like, I don't personally, I don't identify as a curator, but I understand. You like, don't. We do, you know, like there's not a ton of language for like what I do, you mm-hmm. know, so I, I kind of consider myself an organizer or... Um, I, try, I was dating yeah. a woman and I tried to pull that shit on her and she was like, no. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I respect <laughs> curators and, you know, like... But, but I think that may... It, do you think that it's maybe like a thing... Well, in my case, I don't want to project on you. In my case, she was calling me out for not having the willingness to give myself that that title. Yeah. Do, I mean, is, that, is that... Do you feel like that's not what's going on with you? It's probably 50-50. Okay. Yeah, not wanting to take up, you know... Do you mind if I call you? Does it upset you if I call no, you a curator? No, no, yeah. We're here with curator Megan uh, Moore. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just blew out your audio level, sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but no, that's an interesting thing because I totally was like, uh, I, I know you first and foremost as a curator at this yeah. point. This is how we've met. You right, know? right. But it's also funny now that I, uh, I'm thinking, because it's like... Uh, you mentioned political science. <laughs> and I'm like, sometimes I'm embarrassed when I know when I meet someone and I'm like, and I know that they look at my Instagram stories. Oh, <laughs> sure, sure. But, yes. But it's but it's it always makes sense when I see the people that do that aren't don't think I'm crazy mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> following along, which is a, a, always a relief. It's validating when I see people that are like, but understanding that your background is like that and that you're jaded by the military industrial complex, it makes a little bit more sense. Sure. Yeah. Not okay. that I want to talk about that at all, but I feel like that is sort of part of that investigative thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like the critical thinking where sometimes it can get in the way and, <laughs> and be debilitating. Whereas like curation, I think in a sense, it's like writing an essay to, to some degree, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're, you're not using your own ideas, but you're making a broader point by 
citing this artist or this artist, and then you put them all together in one space, and you have this uh, cohesive thing that individually maybe the artists weren't, um, well, that, that reinforces what the artist is doing, but also uh, contextualizes it in a, in a, in a, in a discussion where you're having discussions between pieces, right? Yes, yes. Well, and it's, yeah, I think maybe I resist that term because of how frequently I do it and then just how many other things I do, you know, too, that it's not, uh, it's not my only pursuit. Um, mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is like the Infrastructure Lover Show. I've had that title in my head for eight years, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and finally I think it was like converse, conversations around like supply chain and thinking about source, you know, sourcing materials as artists and, um, you know, source being like inspiration or, you know, kind of spiritual or source being like, I ordered these headphones from Amazon and just like what, what, what is going on with that in, in our, you know, practices um, was kind of the jumping off point for that. A and I think it's, you know, that was informed by like, uh, yeah, pandemic, like, like it was like, okay, it's time to move on this idea. Finally, it just seems like it, it, this idea has come to a head. So there's nothing predictable. There's like, I can't go crank out six shows a year somewhere. Oh no. You know, like I've, I, the last show I did was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm curious, uh, like what would you curate if you curated something? And do you feel like you would have to have a relationship to this show? What do you mean, to, to the show that I'm doing? You, like, like, what's your thesis? Like, do you think of, like, the oh, podcast and curating within the same... Sometimes. I think that the podcast is in its own way curatorial. I'm done curating online. I, you know, a lot of that, the tedium of that is too much for me. Mm -hmm. I just, now I'm just, you know, after losing the account, I, I don't even, like, think of Instagram as, like, a main... Like, Instagram's where I socialize mm -hmm. now. It's not even, like, a business thing, you know? Like, I, it's where I go. I have... And I interact with like you know Deborah, mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. you know because like it's like uh, it's actually Instagram is like a really useful way to just have professional relationships because I feel like once you start texting it can get a little bit weird mm -hmm. where it's like you're you know like you you there's a there's a safety boundary there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas but I just like I mean I watch I see how much I get done or how much entertainment I consume on Instagram. And then I go to TikTok and I'm like, God damn, TikTok, like I don't just aimlessly scroll. Like, th like I scroll something. If I like it, I keep watching, you know, so. What is I, your TikTok like? Uh, right. It's only going to be clips of the show for now, you know. And then, oh, I mean, what are you consuming on TikTok? Oh, uh, just artist things and like really? lightly political stuff. Okay. You know, uh, I, for a while I was running someone else's TikTok and it was fun because they were kind of, uh, they got into thought talk. Oh. <laughs> and I was just what like, is thought talk? Like, uh, do you know what a thought is? It's like a, t a Gen Z term, I think. For, oh, for I don't like, know. For like, uh, let's let's be respectful and call them uh, influencers that are models. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of them that like do dances and stuff, and and I would just like, I was like, oh my god, dude, <laughs> I could like to build my own algorithm to just show me this stuff would be like cringe, but because I could sip, like look at someone else's, I was like. This is kind of amazing. But that that's one of the things that, about it that's so interesting. It's so niche, right? Um, but I don't know. In terms of curating, I do find that the podcast and the curation are separate. I've curated shows of, like at OPAF, I showed work of past guests. Mm -hmm. And that was like, it wasn't like a cohesive show. It was just like kind of art fair yeah. done uh, style. Uh, I've shown... Um, I, I did for Made in LA, I did a ceramic show, and that was a fun thing to do. I really enjoyed it. It was, uh, I, I got to show my mom's work, which was the main point behind it. But I, I, was, I really, I did an open call, and everybody that replied was like, awesome. So I just <laughs> included everybody. It's, it's actually, we're, we're kind of spoiled here in LA, I think. Yes, I agree. Uh, so you can just be like, hey, I'm putting on a show and like have bomb ass shit. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of separating those two, I definitely think that the that the show is kind of more of a. I want to do st some more visual stuff, and I'm interested in having like ha pitching, having people do shows on the channel. Mm -hmm. Like you know, if, for example, if Christine wanted to do a show, I would totally platform it, you know, and then uh, and things like that. But 
um, it's a really time-consuming thing, and I used to think that I had to do it year-round. Yeah. And I, now I'm just like, no, I'll do this for like part of the year, and then the rest of the year I'll make other content. You yes. Know? Yes. So isn't that beautiful? I've recently come to the idea of seasons, where like yeah. there's a season to work, and then there's a season to rest. Like that has just changed everything. Yeah, and I mean, I think that like it's so much easier to do the podcast now. Like I watch the stuff that I haven't released from last year and I'm a little bit like, Oh my God, like, dude, <laughs> you're like, you can tell that I haven't shaved. <laughs> and like, and it's sort of like, and like, I feel weird about releasing it a year later and just kind of having that be representative. But it's, I mean, the conversations are great. So it's not, it's not an issue, but like this whole thing, of like just coming here and doing this in the space. I definitely want to get some footage of your your show and maybe do like a little video of the show as well before we head out. Awesome. But um but yeah, I mean, in terms of that, I find I do like like for example, when I started the show, I didn't really have any like connections at all, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was just something that forced me to reach out to people and, and get in and, and like from there, that's how I got into Monta Vista. Just like, well, I was going to ask what's your relation or like, what's your experience been like there? It's, it's pretty new. We, we just started and when did you start? Uh, when did we start? Like, did you start together? Yeah. Oh. End, end of September. End of September. Okay. October, I, yeah. So end of September, sure. October, it was sometime last year and it was like, they were, they, they just wanted to inject some more life because we were like, all uh, recovering from <laughs> from COVID, and it's it's great. It's mostly been like a really good support system for like us to keep on track. A lot of the stuff is run automatically. I mad props to um, uh, you know Roberta Gentry and Emily Blythe Jones and Deborah who like run the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Like, really, <laughs> the my the role that I see for myself is just basically doing this in conjunction with Monta Vista and and like you know. Sort of with Christine, we've kind of talked about being the AV department, although I don't know how, I, 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 it's not until now that I'm asking myself how bored she is. <laughs> oh, I really enjoy it. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit, I made her just sit here. <laughs> no, I've been staring. Cool. But, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's like, I'm, right now, I'm just excited about like the my the curator curatorial mindset is on this, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. meeting people like you, made it, you know, I I feel like I've been so isolated for so long that like I haven't even done a studio visit, you know. Yeah, yeah. So that's I have to say, like the opening for the show was last night, and I saw people pick up the books I made. You know, like I I've had a couple st- studio visits over the last couple months, but you know, I'm usually like handing people things or you know initiating. Uh, that kind of interaction and to just see people naturally picking things up and looking through it. I was just so excited. I was just so excited. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, it really like it just doing this is just bringing life into me again. You know, like it really is just an excuse to socialize with artists (laughs) and and it remains that way, you know, and now I managed to sneak another artist into this (laughs) equation for today, you know, so it's nice. It's, it it really is a, a, like, this is a podcasting. There's something about sitting down and just having microphones in your faces. You become very aware of what you're talking about, you know? Yes. And, and and it sounds good too. Yeah. (laughs) Congratulations. New mics. This, this whole setup is, is I'm very proud. Like that, my mm-hmm. microphone. But all right, so then, um, so then, like, what is your next step, right? You've made this show. Are you still in a making cycle? You said you were still scanning, so you're, you're continuing this work. Yes, yes, I am. Okay, and having installed it, are there any things that you've learned that are going to affect you the way that you approach it moving forward? Absolutely. So Yes. I've only been working like in this fashion for about a year. Oh, wow. So this is like the, you know, the fifth piece I've made this way. So I've, I've learned a tremendous amount putting this show on from like, um, like registration to how I reinforce the pieces to how I hang them on the wall. Uh, you know, so just like a lot of technical things have become very evident in this show. And then I've gotten a lot of feedback that people are very drawn to the ones that aren't recognizable. So, mm-hmm. you know, I've done ones that are a little bit more 
uh, landmark-ish. And so the ones that people can't necessarily place, they seem to spend more time with or find them more engaging. And that's fascinating feedback. When you say they can't, they can't recognize it as a floor or they can't recognize where it's from? Where it's from. Oh, wow. So people actually know where these... Yeah. Are. <laughs> that's well, I, I was that's exciting too, though. Earlier, like the floor people, sidewalk people came out last night. <laughs> Tell me about it. You told us off my... Yeah. So what were people saying to you? Yeah. So I met somebody who takes photographs of plaques in the ground that um, delineate public you know, versus private space. Someone else uh, who was here takes pictures of uh, contractor stamps and cement. Uh, wow, that's y- so specific. It is. I it's bet beautiful. you they're pretty cool, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's Angela de Avignon, um, who's a friend and collaborator, but uh, she has a great Instagram account called Cement Ed. And Cement so, Ed. Yeah. So, like education of cements. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I do, those are things that you like just completely overlook, and then that person, she found it, and she's like. Eureka! <laughs> yes, yes. Angela's a great person to go on a walk with. Oh, I, I, it sounds like a great person to have on the show. Yeah. Oh, you should. <laughs> yeah, you should. Yeah. She and I worked together on a uh, project where we documented clocks in uh, infrastructure, public infrastructure around Los Angeles. Uh, so we ran an Instagram account uh, called Clocks of LA. And then that's actually how we, I guess we knew Josh before, but that's how we first started working together is uh, he produced the book uh, that was kind of a culmination of that research project. It's also interesting to me that you say that, first of all, okay, two things. You're, you're, you don't c- consider yourself a curator, but you've been curating for longer than me by like a long shot, which is hilarious to me. I totally get the... I'm starting to think that it's less about insecurity and more about like uh, labeling yourself, you know? Yeah, I just want to follow what's interesting and let yeah, that yeah. take... You know, if I give things too much thought, they they get uh, it gets not interesting. Like I get anxious about it in a way that is like not helpful or interesting. So I think just kind of yeah, just getting to like move through ideas and they take on the form they take on is is how I like to think about my creative practice. Is it like a um, I'm a curator and I'm not even curating kind of pressure that you're trying to avoid, or or not like that? No, you know. Honestly, I don't like the way people treat me when I'm a, you know, a curator. I don't like people wanting things from me, mm. you know, like, um, I don't like being treated like I can give somebody something. We're very different. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Powerless man trying to gain power in the uh-huh. art world. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, I've heard that before. I, I have uh, friends that... I've heard it more in in the sense of being frustrated that they're not tr- treated as an artist. Yeah, you know, yeah. which I can totally understand, and I, I'm definitely going through that a little bit. Where it's like, you know, n- most people probably at this point know the show more than they know my work, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. is kind of why I am spending more time on the work side of things. Yeah, but, yeah. But um, but it's it, it's. Uh, it is a like it's interesting how those words have so much weird power like that. Even not not even just on how you identify with yourself, but how like people start approaching you. You know, like oh, Megan's someone who can get opportunities. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. and I think that's a tremendous responsibility if you're an opportunity provider versus yeah. an opportunity needer. And so I try to take that very seriously. Yeah, but I can see how that would be like. Difficult, you know. <laughs> I'm still at the stage where people, where I'm like, oh my God, Josh is letting me record here. <laughs> I know, I know. Josh is so cool. I call him my photo dad. Your him and, photo dad? Yeah, him and Wyatt. Cause they've been so um, generous with the space and also just the context of photography, you know, like pulling me as an image maker into that has been well, incredible. Well, it's amazing. Well, he was speaking very highly of you when, before you got here. And, uh, and like about the turning point that you made when you started to become real specific with the work. And what I found amazing is that you've only been working on this a year. So, uh, like, before this, what were you doing? Or was that a rest period and then you started? Or were you, are you just constantly producing? I have been, I've been scanning things since I, you know, since I got to L.A. in, like, 2015. But I would show, like, croppings of them. You know, so, like, I would take one of these. So what, what we're looking at in the show is, 
essentially tiled together eight and a half by 11. So I would take one of those images and enlarge it, frame it and show it as a, you know, essentially like a photograph, Mm -hmm. but you know, they'd be weird because the depth of field is off or, you know, there's a ton of dust or dirt or, you know, some sort of unexpected thing, you know, and, and I think I was thinking about still lifes, but you know, like when you take a picture with a camera, gravity pulls dust and dirt and debris away from whatever you're trying to capture, you know, and like the scanner actually cap, you know, is the ground. So it captures, you know, all that stuff just falls to it and becomes part of the image. So that, Mm. that was interesting. And yeah, so this is the, this was a decision to tile them for the first time. Yeah. For, for you to get to see like a piece as well as something in its entirety. Yeah, I know it's, it, uh, there is something when you told me that it was a flatbed scanner and you were hitting it, it relieved s- some anxiety that was happening in my head it was like, how did she get it so like perfect without any lens distortions or anything like that, which is fun. But all right. So then you're walking, you're, you're, you're walking around, you have a backpack with a laptop in it yes, and a scanner. Yes. And how, how heavy is this stuff? It's. Not that heavy. It's not that heavy. So yeah. is it easy to just pull out? Yes. It's com- it, it, like, does the laptop stay in the bag? No, it you, comes. It, I just usually, uh, yeah, open the laptop, pull up Epson scanners, you know, like get the lap, you know, get my scanner out, take the lid off, make sure the cord's attached, flip it over and just press scan. And the world reacts to this how? Usually people leave me alone. Sam is generous and usually comes with me just just to help if you know if anything comes up. We really haven't had any anything wild happen, but I would say so, especially working downtown, we're the fifth weirdest thing anybody has seen that day. So as long yeah. as you're not slowing somebody down, they don't give you really any attention. But imagine it's like super vulnerable position. Did it take you a while to get comfortable? It feels yeah. So it's essentially like leading up to going to scan, I, it's like the worst feeling. Okay. We're just like anticipating what it's going to be like feels bad. But as soon as I get there and start working, you know, it's, it's very, it's a straightforward process. So then once I, you know, start working, it's, you can kind of shake that off and yeah. Yeah, get to the get to the kind of like today. Part. Yeah, <laughs> We're just showing up here with all this gear. I'm like, is it gonna work? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, have you thought about doing it at night, it was, or is that less safe? You know, like because I mean, sure. with the scanner, you could probably get away with that, right? Oh yeah, I don't think it would change the image. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think it depends on a lot of things. Like, kind of the first thing in the morning has been a fun time. Mm-hmm. To, you know, because less people are out. Okay. Um, yeah. So somebody did ask if we were ghost hunting once, uh, which I thought was such a such a compliment. That's amazing. Yeah. I want to do a ghost hunting show now that I have all this gear. Please. Yes. <laughs> I'd watch it. Art ghost hunters. Yeah. <laughs> I do like having an audience. <laughs> Christina's just losing it. This ghost feels really abstract. <laughs> she said this ghost feels really abstract. Amazing. Yes. <laughs> uh, how are we doing on a time? Where are we at? Um, we're at 101. Okay. 101? Okay, cool. I, th- I usually can keep track. Th- that's, that's the one vulnerability that I feel here. All right, so I guess we can start wrapping up. Okay. Uh, usually, w- I would be happy to go longer, but since this is the maiden voyage, I want to make sure we got it sure. in the can. But all right, so um, anything that you want to say about, what you've, like, about the process that maybe I haven't been able to uh, get out of you with a, with a good question? Because you know, like, it is a very specific thing. It's outside of my reality. So I maybe not be asking a question that I think go, that might you think might go to the heart of what you're doing. Is there anything that you want to add? Yeah. No, I think uh, I feel very very seen by your questions. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Maybe something just to wrap up with is um, I'd love these things to become books. You, you know, okay. like it's hard to store things. I do kind of have a dream of like down the road I will get to own some sort of property where people can come drop off their like outdoor sculptures or something. And like, I will take care of them. So, <laughs> um, you know, these things are big and, and I can roll them. They live in my studio on rolls essentially. But, um, yeah, I, I kind of want to, because they're eight and a half by 11s, I kind of want to just cut them back up into that format, bind them. And then, you know, they can be, they can live in that format. What about an old school map? 
you know, yeah. that folds out. <laughs> Hell yeah. I don't know if you saw, but I made a, a couple maps on the bookshelf. And so I had not thought about it in this large format. And that's a fantastic idea. Cool. I, I'm happy to help. Yeah, thank oh, you. Oh, what? Here, let me see that. <laughs> we can show it in the video. <laughs> thank you. Actually, you know what? We'll show this on when we do the other. Okay. We'll, we'll just do the other stuff. Cool. Anyway, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. This, it, was, this a, was so much fun. A lot of fun. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I definitely will have you back when you've got more stuff to talk about. Cool. And uh, it's, uh, it's great. Uh, the, uh, what can, uh, where can people find you? Yes. Uh, this show at the Fulcrum Press is up through... Uh, what is it? So through May 2nd, uh, they have gallery hours on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday from 1 to 5. I'd be honored if people checked it out. Definitely recommend it. Thank you. And then I'm on Instagram, and my handle is obnoxious, but essentially it's my name with periods separating every letter in it. So Megan Muller, um, period stashes. Uh, yeah. yeah. I did shot. think about that because I, when I had to come up with a new what's my thesis handle, <laughs> I was like, what's dot my thesis? And I was like, no, there's no way I'm going to say dots every time. So now it's what is my thesis? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah, you guys can find us there and uh, we'll be back next week. Thank you so much for checking us out. And thank you so much, Megan. And uh, jo uh, Josh, Christine, Sam, thank you for hanging out. Uh, yeah, maiden voyage. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. This is fun.